it gives us such strength to, to be able to stand on the backs of each other. In fact, that's one of the sayings of the Wingmans, I got your back, brother. What Wingman is about, Wingman is about relationships. It's about giving guys the opportunity to come together to be able to share their hopes, their desires, their, their shortcomings. But what Wingman is about is diving deeper into those conversations, uh, diving deeper into those relationships where we can encourage one another, we can accept, we can affirm, and we can hold one another accountable. It helps me uh, relate to uh, the problems that other men are encountering in their life, uh, which gives me uh, uh, some more tools to work with. It. Yeah, just a, a really good group, um, you know, open to anybody. Wingman is not about church, it's not about religion. Uh, it's been just a phenomenal experience for me. One word to describe Wingman for me, and that's relationships. Men are looking for something real. People are busier than they've ever been. Uh, this is a, a group of men that are serious about being good men, being good fathers, being good and honest businessmen, and making an impact uh, on their children, on their relationships. And we do that by being in strong relationships with each other. You need that in life, and you need your wingman beside you, and that's what this provides. It's about um, holding each other accountable. It's about having somebody by your side that you can share your, your biggest problems, your biggest concerns with, and you know he's not gonna judge you, uh, but he's going to hold you accountable. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. I'm glad you're here. As you can uh, tell, one of the reasons why are we here? You know, we're we're men's ministry. But predominantly why we're here, we are looking for a good excuse to come together to support one another because football season's over with. <laughs> and we needed something to do, right? Hey, yeah, that's right, Kevin. We're not supposed to tell secrets. But I'm glad you're here tonight. And I just um, wanted to say a few things. wanted to thank Irving Bible Church for allowing us to utilize their facility to have Dr. Eager come and to speak to you all. Dr. Eager's had a very busy day today. She spoke at Liberty Christian School to several hundred kids there, as well as parents. And this is actually her third engagement. And for an 87-year-old lady, she is full of energy, and she's doing a phenomenal job. But one of the reasons why we wanted to do this, too, is to let some of you know, some of you already do know, but about Wingman. Wingman is the host. We're putting this on today because this is one of the opportunities that we have as men to, to reach out to the community, to, to give back. We base this ministry off of 1 Samuel 22, the first two verses, 1 and 2. And in those verses, it talked about King David fleeing the king of Gath, the Philistine king. And he went to the cave of Abdullam. And there he said that everybody that was in distress, everybody that was in debt, everybody that was discontented went to him. And what does that mean You know, in, in a modern contemporary setting? Those guys are in distress. Those are the individuals that, hey, I'm on the verge of divorce. Hey, I've got a substance abuse problem. Hey, I've got an addiction problem. Or, or they're contemplating suicide. One of those things that where they pray that very powerful prayer, God help me. Those guys are in debt. Those are the guys who potentially could be, you know, anyone. Any, if you're unemployed, underemployed, it could be also those guys who have made a heck of a lot of money. But they look back in their lives and say, hey, there's got to be something more to life than this. And then those guys who are discontented. Those are the guys who, you know, unfortunately today, not an indictment against the American church, but the primary reason why a lot of men go to church are for their wives and for their kids. Church is meaningless to them. And we're there to, to, to uh, accept, to affirm, and to hold them accountable. So you got the three days, but we also have that AAA roadside service. It's the three A's. Because you look at, you know, the primary means, the psychological means, the, the physical needs of a man, you know, the physical intimacy always ranks right up there, but it's also the opportunity that a man needs to be affirmed. He needs to be told or needs to at least have those feelings that his life counts, his life matters. He is honored as an individual. 
as a son of the living God who we all strive to be. So we accept, we affirm, and, and the purpose of Wingman essentially is to encourage men to form those transparent, Christ-centered, masculine relationships. That's all we are. We're not a church. We're not necessarily a prayer ministry organization. We're, we're not here to supplant the church. We're here to support the church. Because the model in which we kind of do our thing is we gather together, we do put on corporate events. We typically meet at the Lancaster Theater every other Friday. So we meet twice a month corporately. And I bring in great speakers, anything from individuals like Dr. Eager to professional athletes, Navy SEALs, um, businessmen. Individuals that just have a valid story that can relate to men. Those are the individuals that come and speak, but the lifeblood of our organization is on the opposing Fridays where we have groups, small groups of men we call element groups that gather together and meet at an IHOP, meet at a corner bakery where they sit across the table from each other, look across the table and say, hey, Bob, how's it going? You know, Bob kind of goes the typical male response, hey, it's, it's good. And you look at him and you go, okay, bull, tell me what's going on. And the guys can be transparent because they know what's said there stays there, and it's a safe, safe location, it's a safe venue. That's what Wingman is. And we're there to just provide that aspect of acceptance, affirmation, and accountability. But one of the things that we're also trying to do is we're also trying to reach out and to give back, to encourage our guys to get involved because a faith without works is a dead faith. A lot of our guys get involved in the community by doing prison ministry by you know, helping widows and orphans uh, repair their cars, of just getting involved in whatever aspect, whatever God has placed on their heart, that's what we do to support. We've also started up this past year another element of Wingman called Wingman Varsity, where we're going into schools, and we're trying to impact those young men by giving them mentors. You know, unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, through athletics, there's a lot of young men out there that, that don't have dads. We don't have parents. You know, both parents may be incarcerated, whatever, but we're there to provide that male mentorship, that male role model th through the coaches. And again, we're not in competition with I Am Second, with FCA, with uh, Young Life. We're there to support and to lift up those organizations who are doing a great work. But we're there, you know, we're trying to stem the tide of just Christian men coming together to do what God's called us to be, to be the salt and light, to be that city on a hill, and to follow whatever that will, whatever that purpose that is in each and every one of us that God is calling us to do. That's what Wingman is. So in, in that spirit of that aspect tonight, since this is free for you all, and this is we'd like to continue to do this periodically, but we highlighted one local charity where we're trying to raise funds for. We're trying to give back. Our local charity is Christian Community Action this evening. Christian Community Action is a, is a service that really helps people who are at risk, those individuals who uh, can't make payments on bills, who may uh, have just found themselves without of, out of work. These are individuals, what CCA does is, is they provide food services, they provide medical services, they provide training. They've impacted over 10,000 people annually in a variety of different services. They have different stores. Uh, Christian Community Action stores in different municipalities throughout the Metroplex where they sell goods to help support the ministry. But CCA, what it does, is it, it really is the true holistic missions or ministry where they're helping the mind, body, and soul. And there's going to be an opportunity, I'll play a video here that'll shortly, that'll show a little bit more about what they do and what their ministry is. But, you know, as the Lord leads you, I'd like for you to ask when you leave, they have a table set out there, but there will also be some individuals with baskets who will be just taking donations on their behalf tonight. So if you're called, please, please give. Okay? So with that, if we could roll the video for Christian Community Action.
You know, unfortunately, CCA is probably the best kept secret around. Not too many f folks really know about what they're doing, and I'm trying to help them change that. So if you can help me join me in, in, in doing that, that would be just awesome because they're really trying to give a, people a, a hand up and not necessarily a hand out. Um, some of you have had questions about tonight. We will, we are videotaping this presentation, so if you had friends or family members or individuals who couldn't be here tonight, you can go to our website, wingmen.org. I don't know if we had a slide for that, wingmen.org. And for those of you men who are potentially interested in coming to see what we're all about, Next time we meet at the Lancaster Theater in Grapevine, 300 South Main Street, Dr. John Townsend will be our next speaker there this next Friday. Not t tomorrow, but the next Friday. Um, so wingmen.org. You can learn all about that too. Now, before I bring Dr. Eager up, it's always a custom that we do at Wingman. I'd like to do it here tonight too. I'd like for you to just take a couple minutes, get out of your comfort zone, Reach across the aisle or reach across the chair, shake somebody's hand you don't know, introduce yourselves. As I mentioned before, we have, I bring in speakers from across the broad demographic of experiences to speak at Wingman. Well, this past October, through my good friend and actually Dr. Eager's bodyguard, <laughs> Mike Hogue. Mikey boy. Mikey boy, that's right. <laughs> We call him Huggy Bear. <laughs> but uh, she is the first female that has ever addressed our men in almost over 10 years of ministry. And I tell you, to hold the attention of 150 plus guys for over an hour, literally, the men, am I not right, were eating on the palm of her hand. <laughs> it's a special lady. It is a very special lady. And I'm, I'm I am, I am proud, I am pleased to introduce tonight a lady that, uh, a beautiful young lady. <laughs> you know how she talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> Oscar, take notes. Remind my wife, Tammy, that, that she said that, okay? It's on, it's on tape. It's on tape. <laughs> but a young lady who has had so many experiences and had uh, potentially had the opportunity just to say... I, I don't want to do it anymore. But to turn that around, to use that, that, that passion, that feeling for the good, it, it is a gift of God and it's it is grace that she is here today. And as a ballerina, she uh, has some pretty good moves too <laughs> that she may show us at some point in time. But let's all give a rousing, I'll go wingman round of applause for Dr. Edie Eager. Thank you, thank you. What a joy, what a wonderful experience. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Shall we talk about love? I see a man right here who speaks Hungarian. There you go, we have all kinds of people here. And I just met a wonderful man. His name is Oscar. Would you please come here, Oscar? Oscar uh, fled Mussolini from Italy, the family. And he is here. And right away he said, I have an Italian restaurant. And tomorrow I'm going to treat you. Absolutely. And what's the name of the restaurant? It's uh, Patrizio's South Lake. Be sure that yes. you and experience. Thank you. I, I told him I love Osobuco, and that's oh what I'm going to get tomorrow with polenta. polenta oh, my bottle. God. Manja, manja. Yeah, that's, yeah. So how can we turn life into a constant celebration? You know, this is evening time, and I was praying to God what really can be tonight and in what way I can be guided and so I can guide you to somehow make peace with your past, with your roots, because that morning sunshine doesn't come back. I cannot offer you a happy childhood now, but I can tell you 
that you can be a good parent to you, that you can give yourself the gift of life. Lifestyle, uh, lifestyle means to have more life. But when we are born, you know, we are very helpless, very, very helpless, and we depend on someone to take care of us. We all need touch, human touch. Babies who are not touched, they die. They die of marasmus. It's called the shriveling of the spine. During World War II, there was this guy uh, who uh, went to the daycare center and saw babies being fed through some kind of a contraption, and, and uh, they were not picked up. His name was Rene Spitz. And uh, the autopsy showed that the babies died of the shriveling of the spine called marasmus. And he said to the nurses, you have to go out uh, wherever you go to the parks and pick up all those people and the babies have to be picked up and the death rate stopped. So I am sure that you are here, we're all touched. Human touch is human touch. We all have skin hunger. And tonight, I like to touch you. I like to touch your soul. I like to tell you that, that uh, there is hope in hopelessness. That, that's why I'm wearing the color green. Is the, the color is for hope. And I can tell you how we don't seem to appreciate sometimes what we have until we lose it. And you will see that tomorrow I will finish everything on my plate. I take nothing for granted. I eat up. Last night I ate up other people's leftovers. <laughs> and, and I had the best filet mignon. Texas has a good beef. You're good. And you have good people in Texas here. You are good, wonderful people. I spoke to a school today. It's called Liberty Christian School. Anybody here from Liberty? Uh, those most wonderful teachers. Everybody is smiling. And uh, you see, our children don't do what we say. They do what they see. People ask me, what is the best thing for children? And my answer is a happy marriage. And I hope that you are in a happy marriage. And I hope that... Uh, Tonight, you're going to go home and see in what way, whether you're treating yourself well, whether you are really finding hope in hopelessness, whether you are able to somehow be good role models. I travel all over the world, but when I met the wingman, I was so impressed that they, they pick up, they pick up the the sons who doesn't have fathers, they go everywhere. They want to make the world a better place. So I'm going to call them the ambassadors for peace and goodwill. All the wingmen, would they please stand up and show, show everyone how beautiful you are. Thank you so much. God love you. Thank you. I also would like to say that women would possibly start a wing woman. <laughs> All right? Because you see, I tell women that age is not an issue. Age is, to me, I don't count. I'm 86 years old. I know Hungarian women always lie about their, their age, and people call me Zsa Gabor and all kinds of names that I've been gotten. But you see, age is just a number. I feel younger now than when I came to America. When I came to America in 1949, I, I didn't have $6 to get off the boat. My late husband, who I met in a TB hospital in 1945, we were all shipwrecked. He was a partisan. And uh, you know, those days, people wrote letters. We didn't have text. We didn't have any of that. We fall in love through letters, writing letters. I was in a TB hospital, and uh, I didn't have TB. I had pneumonia. I had five kinds of typhoid fever. 
I was very, very ill, and actually, I was very suicidal. Because, and this is what I find with the depressed people, when you get up in the morning and you don't see what, you see what for. That you don't have any meaning in your life. That you don't have any purpose in your existence. The person, of course, that I adored and I met, I studied with, his name is Viktor Frankl. Man's Search for Meaning would be a very good book for you to pick up because he was also in the camp. And uh, yeah, um, having such a wonderful experience with him, and he talked about that existential vacuum. And I was very suicidal because you see, it's easier to die than to live. If you look up your birth certificate, it's not going to say that life is easy. I hope to make it easier, but it's not easy. Life is difficult. Look up your birth certificate. Does it say life is easy? Does it say there is a guarantee and certainty? No, but there is probability. So tonight I want to talk about the love. I'm going to talk about the faith. I'm talking about Auschwitz that became a kind of a doorway for many opportunities that I became a more resilient, a more, more person who I am not a strong woman, I am a woman of strength. And so are you. That that power comes from within because dependency breeds depression. So I came to America penniless. Why? Because I married, sometimes we talk about did you marry up or did you marry down? <laughs> well, I married up all right, but I didn't know who I married because I met this man and he had a grocery store and he had food. People ask me, did you love your, did you love your husband? I say, love, what's that? He had food. <laughs> he had cheese. He had Swiss cheese. <laughs> you see, we don't grieve over what happened. We grieve over what didn't happen. I remember when my first granddaughter was born in San Diego, California. The pediatrician examined her, little Lindsay, and said, this little girl is flexible. She might become a ballerina. And I said, great, now I can die because, of course, my blood is in her. And we have now three generations. And uh, she became a ballerina. I saw the Nutcracker Suite 200 times. <laughs> and, uh, and what happened that she went to a wonderful school in La Jolla, California, where I live. And she went to bishop school. And uh, she came to me and said, Grandma, would you buy me a dress so I can go to my, my dance? I am a big sucker, the biggest sucker. I bought her the most beautiful dress. I think it was a Laura Ashley. And I came home, and I began to cry. I didn't understand why am I crying. The word understand is very academic. You see, if you want to understand something, go to the classroom. But you cannot heal what you don't feel. And I didn't realize that I'm not crying because Lindsay went to a dance. I cried because I never went to a dance. And this is the work I do today. I, that's why I'm Dr. Edith Eva Eager, because I went to school. And I didn't speak a word of English when I came to America. And guess what? It's only in America when you come last in a revolving door, and then I graduated with honors from the University of Texas in El Paso. I want to tell you that this is where I want to show to you uh, what happens when everything is taken away from you and you're relying from your inner strength. So I, I want to take you on that journey because I married this man whose family was one of the wealthiest in Czechoslovakia. They not only had a grocery store, but they had a flour mill and uh, what, what not. 
But when the communists came, they confiscated the business and they threw my husband in jail. You see, I'm a survivor. I don't say, why me? I'm saying, now, now what do I do? And I packed up and I went to the jail and I took off my big diamond ring and I put this in my little girl's diaper and we fled overnight to Vienna. In Vienna, Austria, I went to the American consulate and I found out that I can come to America. And I came to America in 1949. I came to America in 1949, late in October, and you had Halloween and I thought you're so funny. I didn't know what to do with my experience because I had survivor's guilt. I had survivor's shame. So if you ask me who I was, I would say, who do you want me to be? Because I just wanted to be a Yankee Doodle Dandy. I wanted to be like you. I wanted to speak English without an accent. I spent three years at the university trying to get rid of my accent. It can show, you know, let me tell you how far I've gotten with that. I had a beautiful professor who said, Edie, I'm beginning to speak with a Hungarian accent. <laughs> Why don't you get out of here? Your English is fine. So my little girl went to a daycare center. I worked in a factory doing piecework. And I remember my little girl telling me, you have to buy a turkey because Thanksgiving is coming up. Well, I didn't know what a turkey, Thanksgiving, nothing. Because you see, if you're a child of an immigrant, and I don't know if you are, the children become the ambassadors. She learned how to, how to speak English. She taught me chicken little, goosey Lucy, turkey lurkey. I didn't know lurkey from turkey and ducky from lucky. And the children become the ambassador. She, she introduced me to Jiffy and, and peanut butter and tuna fish. I didn't know any of that. And uh, actually, I wrote my doctoral thesis on the idea that children who experience calamitous events do not grow up to be maladjusted human beings. On the contrary. On the contrary. You see, when I got married in 1946, and I became pregnant, and the doctor told me, I can't have a child, I'm not strong enough. This is in Czechoslovakia and came to the house and, and wanted to convince me that uh, I'm not going to take that risk. But you see, again, I am the survivor. And I looked at the doctor and I said, sir, I want to give life. I don't want to take every life. And my little girl was born, and she was a 10-pounder, and I could have had a horse doctor, you know? <laughs> so question authority, if you have. Question authority. Don't just blindly adhere to authority. So my little two-year-old goes to a daycare center, a beautiful Christian woman, uh, Mrs. Bauer in Baltimore, Maryland, took care of my little girl. And, uh, and she came home, and she said, you got to buy a turkey. And of course, I couldn't afford the turkey. But I went to Pratt Street in Baltimore, Maryland, and I looked across the street, and they had a supermarket called Schreiber's. I went to the supermarket, and I found the smallest little chicken. And I told today, the teachers have to fire up to shed a light. I am a former teacher and a counselor in the state of Texas. I did my choreography. I was totally fired up. I did the high kick, and I said, guess what, Marianne? We're going to have a baby turkey. <laughs> so the idea that you always turn something into an opportunity to find good in everything bad. Because maybe life is like going through a tunnel. You can't go above it or under it. You got to go through it. That's the only way. That's the only way to go through it. There is meaning in suffering. There is a way to have an opportunity. 
for you to discover many, many traits, and that's how I'm going to take you for that ride tonight. I was working very, very, very hard. I became a high achiever because I never thought I deserved to survive. So I went to the university and I studied and I studied and I studied and I graduated with honors, but I never showed up for my graduation. They told me where to pick up my cap and gun because I said to myself, I don't deserve it because my parents died, my friends died, and I did not forgive myself that I survived. Today I probably would shout from the rooftop, but at the time, I never showed up for my graduation. I had tremendous shame and guilt that I survived. I didn't need the Nazis. I had one in me that really didn't allow me even celebrate my hard work. So I began to work in a military hospital, doing my doctoral work, and I began to work with post-traumatic stress disorder. This is William Beaumont Army Medical Center in Fort Bliss, Texas. And I never forget that I had two paraplegics, both coming from Vietnam, same symptomatologist, same diagnosis, same prognosis, two entirely different responses. One of them was in a fetal position, why me? Screaming at country, God, you name it. Why me? Conversely, the other one said to me, you know, he doc, it's very interesting. Uh, God has given me a second chance in life, and I'm, uh, I can see my children now much closer. I can see the flowers, and, you know, I'm just so grateful that... I have this new beginning now, and I have a white coat, and it says Dr. Eager, Department of Psychiatry, and I'm feeling like an imposter because I had a 16-year-old in me that I didn't face, that I ran away from, that I had a secret, and there's a secret had me. And they're the ones that I'm so grateful for because I decided it's time to go back to Auschwitz. And this is the work I do today, to guide people to face their fears, to revisit those places where they've been, but not to camp there, not to set up a household there. I'm going through the valley of the shadow of that, but not getting stuck in there. So I called my sister Magda, who was with me in Auschwitz, and I said, we lost our family, and I never went to a funeral. I want to go and honor my parents. Would you come with me? And my sister said, who is 92 years old, who is a master in bridge, <laughs> and sometimes she plays with Omar Sharif, and she tells me he doesn't look like he did in <laughs> Dr. Givardo. <laughs> anyway, my sister Magda said to me, I think you're an idiot. What's the matter with you? Are you a masochist or something? But I'm going to take you with me because that was the most positive, positive journey I have ever taken because I needed to go back to that lion's den. I needed to look at that lion in the face. I'm needing to uh, finally forgiving myself that I survived. And so when I arrived in Auschwitz, the other day I saw a movie called uh, Saving Mr. Banks. And I love Yogi Berra who said, it ain't over until it's over. You know, I'm still not done because there was a father-daughter relationship in that movie. It's a very good one. And my father came to me, came to me, and I began to cry and cry buckets because my father was a tailor 
who became a couturier, uh, uh, a dress designer. And I had two beautiful sisters, Magdalena, who is alive, Clara, who was a child prodigy in violin, and she was accepted at the music conservatory in Budapest, and uh, she was already in a camp when her Christian professor smuggled her out and hit her until the end of the war. You are those kind of people I know. I was in a school today, and they're reading the book, The Hiding Place, by Corinne Boone. I highly recommend, because she is my hero. She and I lectured at the William Jules Baptist College in Missouri. Anybody from there? Ah, there you go, there you go. So as I tell you the story, as you see what I'm doing, I'm going from here to here and here to here because it's the hardest talk. I can talk to you about psychology, philosophy, everything. But my father came to me because when I was young, she looked at me and she said, out of the three girls, you have the best figure. And when you grow up, you'll be the best dressed girl in town. And I want to say, Papa, watch me, watch me. I like, to, I like to put myself as well together. I go for sales. I, I, I'm pretty good. If you want to go shopping for designer's clothes, take me with you. I know which one. I know which one to get. So, you know, it's not over. I'm still in a process of becoming. And once I arrive, I'll be dead. And that's OK. That's OK, because that is the last celebration of life. Elizabeth kubler rose talk about it. But, the, the, but it has the stages, the shock, the denial, the anger. And of course, anger, anger will protect you. Anger, that's why people are not letting go of the anger, because then you feel that deep hurt and pain. But I'm hoping to be a guide to you tonight, that you can somehow welcome tomorrow as the Valentine's Day, that you choose love, that you choose love because love can conquer all. And self-love is self-care. It's not narcissistic. Selfish people don't like themselves. So when I was in a cattle car, my mom said to me, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mind. And that's why I love to speak to young people because they are the future. They are the future presidents of this United States, and we are responsible to be good role models to them. I have no time to hate. If I would hate, I would still be a prisoner. But I know that my parents had to die, so I can be here with you tonight. And so when I arrived in May 1944 in Auschwitz, it's documented by the Red Cross, so I know that it was May 22nd, 1944, uh, and I never forget the day when I met the angel of death. He was no angel, called Dr. Mengele. And Dr. Mengele pointed to the left and pointed to the right, and I held my mom, and my sister held my mom, and she was in the middle, and Dr. Mengele pointed my mom to go this way, and my sister and I that way. I followed my man, uh, my mom, and, and the very man who sent my parents to the gas chamber grabbed me, looked me in the eye, and said, you're gonna see your mother very soon. She's just gonna take a shower. So you think my life was in Dr. Mengele's hand? I don't think so. I think God had a plan for me to be here with you and talk to you about resilience, perseverance, and the inner strength. So when we arrived in a place called Gunz, not Gunz, um, Birkenau, 
because the women were in Birkenau, the men were in Auschwitz. I asked one of the inmates, when will I see my mother? She, t she pulled out my earrings. I was bleeding. I said, I would have given it to you. But this is called displaced aggression because she took her anger out in me. I am part of the final solution in Eichmann. I was one of the last ones to go to Auschwitz. Many people call me the Anne Frank who didn't die because I had the same background she did. I studied Latin and Greek and I became very, very erudite. I remember my two sisters blindfolded me because I was cross-eyed and uh, they didn't want anybody to see uh, my ugly face. Today I tell children, don't allow other people to divine who you are. You're beautiful because God doesn't make junk. I, I can tell you that my mom told me I was about 10 years old and she said, I'm so glad that you have brains because you have no looks. <laughs> and I walked in the streets of Hungary and I looked down because I didn't want you to be in shock of my ugly face. I'm not, I'm not angry at my mom, but she always told me to show my physical beauty rather than, she told me not to play bridge with the guys because I'm never gonna get a husband. You see, those days, the boys were taught to become somebody, but the girls were taught to find somebody because you're nobody till somebody loves you. Well, you are a somebody. I am a somebody. And now, things are very different because now, when my daughter got pregnant, she didn't tell me I'm pregnant. She said, we are pregnant. They go to the Lamaze method. They do everything together. And that's why I love the pioneer woman in America because she didn't have to burn her bras and she was alongside of, of her man. The industrial society, I think, when women completely became dependent on men, I have worked very hard uh, building transitional living centers for battered wives. I do everything in my power to let men know not to, no matter how your wife is nagging, no matter what she does, it doesn't ever give you a license to put your hand on a woman. I came home from Washington, D.C. I talked to the Marines about sexual harassment. I'm bringing it to the fore. I want to do everything preventively that we can about that. So, when I asked her, when will I see my mother? She pointed at the chimney and fire was coming out of the chimney. And she said, your, your mother is burning there. You might as well talk about her in past tense. So the question I ask you, how can you find within you when nothing comes from without? And my sister and I hugged each other and she said, the spirit never dies. And I know my parents' spirit is here with me tonight, and I want to really let you know that the most beautiful gift of God is a good gift of memory. And I remember I needed to go back to Auschwitz. I needed to thank my mother that she, she was right, because today my name is Dr. Edith Eva Eager. I touch Everything, when I went back to Auschwitz, I found the barrack. Um, I don't know if it was the barrack where I was. But I was wondering, is there such a thing as a survivor's personality? What, what, what makes a survivor's personality versus a victim's personality? 
I think survivors are flexible, not rigid. So when we hugged and Magda told me the spirit never dies, next thing we knew that we were shaped completely, completely. So here comes my sister Magda, who was the pretty one in my family, and she has her hair in her palms and asks me, how do I look? It's a Hungarian girl's question. How do I look? Now I realized that I became her mirror. And I had a choice, as you have a choice now, whether you're going to point out what is right about the person, what is good about that person, or you're going to pay attention what they lost right now. And I remember I said to Magda, you have beautiful eyes. And you know, I didn't see it when you had your hair all over the place. <laughs> That's where I began to practice. You know why the Seahawks won, you know that. Because they studied the Denver Broncos and some of the people are my patients who went up to New York to support the Broncos and came home, they were slaughtered. <laughs> because, the, because the Seahawks work with uh, Ralph Jackson, who t teaches you to find the power within you. The prayers really helped. That's where I discovered God. The God that showed me that I can change hatred into pity. And that night, Dr. Mangala came to the barracks and he wanted to be entertained. And guess what? My friends who knew that I was the one, come on, come on, little Hungarian guy, come on. Come on, honey. Come on. Come on. I was a dancer. And I, I welcome the Hungarian president. And I'm going to show you a chardash. Go to the, as I say, as I say, aki neka seme kek, aki neka seme kek. Why you put it out and then it's a bit kek. It is and then I don't know, I'm not going to eat sick. As I say, as I say, aki neka seme kek, aki neka seme fekete. Thank you very much. I was such a Hungarian nationalist. I cried when I heard the anthem. But Hungary was taken over by the Nazis, uh, March 1944. So Dr. Mengele came and wanted to be entertained. And guess what? They volunteered me, and I was dancing for Dr. Mengele, who pointed who to take to the gas chamber, and I began to pray. Not for me. I, give, I began to pray for him so he wouldn't send me to the gas chamber. And I closed my eyes, and I pretended that the music was Tchaikovsky and I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet at the Budapest Opera House. Today I told the children, the precious children at the school, that I did research. And most students spend only 10 minutes a whole week being 100% in the class. They, they dissociate. And if you were perhaps abused as a child, if you were sexually abused, as a child, that's when, that's when your childhood ended. And you were far more in prison than I was in Auschwitz because I knew who was the enemy. I was told every day I'm never going to get out of here alive. So when I danced for Dr. Mengele and I'm praying for him, and he gave me a piece of bread, and I was on the top. The, it was three layers. 
and we had one hand, one foot, one hand, one foot. So if you wanted to turn around, you had to go one, two, three, all six of us. Cooperation was the name of the game, not competition, not domination. All we had was each other then, and guess what? All we have is each other now. Life was very difficult in, uh, in Auschwitz because we didn't know what's going to happen next. There is difference between stress is good, but distress is when you don't know what's going to happen next. When I began to work with Vietnam veterans, they had survivor's guilt because they thought if I would have been here instead of there, then my body wouldn't have died. And after all these years, they're still there. They're not capable of somehow moving beyond. I do a lot of work with post-traumatic stress disorder. I have it too. I have it too. When I see a policeman, I startle. I remember I was driving 40 miles an hour in a 25-mile zone, and I was <laughs> clocked. I began to have tachycardia, I'm shaking, okay, and I'm begging not to get the ticket with all my charm. I did get the ticket anyway, <laughs> it didn't work. So I'm telling my daughter what happened. And my daughter, who's a brilliant psychologist, and she said to me, mother, it's only money. It had nothing to do with money. I know that I was driving in La Jolla, and one part of, uh, of a street is blocked off with barbed wire. The minute I saw the barbed wire, I have flashbacks. I'm in Auschwitz. People died in Auschwitz before the Nazis got to them. We call those people the muscle men, the walking dead. And people also ran into the barbed wires and they were electrocuted. So Auschwitz was very, very, very difficult because we never knew when I take a shower whether water is going to come out or gas. But I remember that uh, we try to try to try to stay alive to help one another. My blood was drawn about twice a week, and I spoke German fluently, I asked, why do you take my blood? And a guy said to me, I take your blood to aid the German soldiers so we can win the war and take over the world, especially America. I couldn't yank my arm away. I wouldn't be here telling you about it. But I said to myself, with my blood, you're never going to win the war. So, so now I know what Bob Hope is doing with humor. With humor, that's the best tranquilizer. And if you want to sleep, have 10 minutes a day belly laugh, and you're never going to have insomnia. <laughs> Try it. Better than sleeping pills. I stood in line to get my tattoo. I didn't get it. I was told I'm going to the gas chamber. They don't want to waste the ink on me. And we said goodbye to each other. And next thing I knew, there was a hand picking me up, putting me on the top of a train, a train, and we carried ammunition for the Nazis. I was taken out of Auschwitz. I think it was December 1944. I carried ammunition. I worked in factories. I. Uh, as, as the Russians came from one end, Americans from the other end. Of course, I wouldn't be here today without the Normandy invasion. But I'd like to tell you that we were put one time in a little German village in a community hall, and we were told if you dare to leave the premises, you're going to be shot right away. My sister Magda, who was heavier than I was, suffered more from hunger than I did. I remember eating the soup and saving the bread so I can give it to her the following day. 
So she told me, if I don't get some food, I'm going to die. And I went outside, and I saw some carrots in the next uh, garden. I didn't have any respect for other people's property. And I jumped, and I stole the carrots, and I came up, and I met the man with a gun. I never held a gun in my life, but I heard the clicking about three times again. I started to pray, not for me. And there was an eye contact. And he looked at me, and I don't know how many of you had German fathers. You know, he had that look, that fatherly look, that I'm going to teach you a lesson right now. And he turned the gun around, and he pushed me inside. I had the carrots. I gave it to Magda, shared the carrots with the girls. And the following morning, came and wanted to know who dared to, to break the rules. And I crawled to him, and I'd like you to know that this is April 1945, when the German people are starving. And he gave me a little loaf of bread, and he said, you must have been very hungry for what you did. Wouldn't it be nice if I could meet that man today? You see, God sent this diamond my way. I wish I could see that man today. Not all Germans were Nazis. Not labeling is my way just to say that good people do bad things. But while it's happening, I'm here to tell you what have I learned about the power, the power of God that brought me here tonight with you. Things were much worse after that. I was in a place called Mauthausen, standing in front of the crematoria, and they changed their minds, and I survived what is called today the death march. And in the death march, in the death march, if you shot, uh, if you stopped, you were shot right away. I revisited that place myself. I saw the ditches. And I began to slow down, and I'm speaking to God that I don't think I can walk any further because I'm very ill, and I'm walking, and I'm starting to stop. And the girls that I shared the bread with in Auschwitz came, and they formed a chair with their arms, and they carried me so I wouldn't die. Isn't that amazing? That if you're only for the me, 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 you didn't make it. All we had was each other then and again. All we have is each other now. I couldn't talk to that empty place here. I want to thank you so much for coming. And then I arrived in a place called Gunzkirchen, Gunzkirchen, there was a plan that they put a bomb in each of the corners and we were going to be blown up there. That was the plan. And the man who was supposed to execute the order fled. And on May 4th, 1945, the saints came marching in the 71st Infantry. Anybody, whoever can find anyone from the 71st Infantry. The saints came marching in, and they gave me M&Ms. And this morning, that little girl in the school brought me M&Ms. Imagine, imagine. What is wonderful about that is that I was invited a while ago to go to Forest Carson, Colorado. And I arrived, and there was a big sign. Welcome, Dr. Edith Eva Eager. I'm going to lecture on PTSD. And I realized that it's the home of the 71st Infantry. Imagine how God works, how things come around. Isn't that amazing? But you see, when we were liberated, we were so brainwashed because I was told every day I'm never going to get out of here alive. 
So when we were liberated, the gates were open, and people would go through the gate, but after a while, they would come back. That's what's happening with the battered wife. She goes back anywhere from 7 to 15 times because she is so brainwashed, there is no way she can make it without him. So, so you see, freedom is very scary because when you're free, you can't pass the buck. But there is no freedom without responsibility. It's anarchy. In my practice, I write constitutions for families that there is no freedom without responsibility. I remember I was invited to dinner uh, when I started to work with a family. They were just coming home to, uh, to the Midwest, and uh, mother introduced me to the children. This is my shy one, this is my giggly one, and so on. And um, uh, I was painfully shy as a child, and when they sit down, I turned to the shy one, and I said, uh, you have such beautiful eyes. And the mother kicked me under the table. Don't tell my daughter she's going to be conceded. All right? So I know there is no positive reinforcement in this family. And then there was a little boy, itty bitty boy, and went to mom and pulling mom because the boy wanted to be picked up. And the mother was saying, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. And uh, little children are geniuses. I saw the little boy going to the living room. They just came back from Germany, and they had those little dolls on the coffee table. And just about, he touched one. Mother came in, picked up the little boy. Didn't I tell you not to touch? See, children learn how to get attention, any attention. Bad attention is better than no attention. Bad breath is better than no breath. And, and so I... I talk to parents about paying attention what you're paying attention to because this little boy now knows what to do to get picked up in this family. I hope that you will go home and you look at really your life and your family because you know the biggest concentration camp is in your own mind and the key is in your pocket and yes, I have a dream. I have a dream as long as I live that I do everything in my power to see to it, that we can embrace each other, that we can hold hand in hand, and we can form a human family as those wonderful wing men are doing. I hope that you will start the wing women here. Anybody wants to volunteer, go see my little Mikey boy or Chad, because this is a wonderful place here that we can really empower each other and form a human family that I can be I, you can be you, but together we're going to be so much stronger, so much stronger than me alone and you alone. And this is my dream. And when I'm going to lie on my deathbed, I'm never going to regret when I said yes to something. So yes, say yes to life. Say yes to the beautiful time that we had here tonight that uh, we formed this wonderful human family here. I'm hoping that you will go home, that you are going to embrace your family, that you're going to open up your heart. Because when I went back to Auschwitz and I was coming out, I saw a, a, a soldier, a Polish soldier, and for a moment, I thought, for a moment, I thought I was in a camp and I am with the Nazi. But the realization that I had a blue American passport in my pocket, I was able to reclaim my innocence. I was able to assign the shame and guilt to the perpetrator and finally, sir, finally forgive myself that I survived. I didn't go back to stop my Hungarian accent. You know, I'm not Popeye. I am what I am. I am what I choose to be. I'm as happy as I make up my mind this moment. What keeps me young, that I live in the present, because I can only touch you 
now. I want to touch you and hug you, and I want to love this wonderful evening, the memories that we make. And I found God in the darkest places. And tonight, I feel so wonderfully close to that wonderful heavenly God that brought me here, to the wingman, to the women, to the wonderful, wonderful congregation here. God love you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Have a seat. Before we dismiss here, too, I, I just, if anybody has any questions, Dr. Eager would be happy to, uh, to take those. So the lights aren't too bright here. I can see hands. Anybody have any particular questions that they'd like to ask Dr. Eager? Ma'am. You're such an inspirational person, uh, and you're so gorgeous, even though you're 87. I hope I'm just like you. Um, what's your biggest... Don't worry um, about midlife crisis. There is no such thing. <laughs> there is no crisis in the world. There are only transitions. There are no problems in the world. There are only challenges. Um, what's your biggest yeah. piece of advice for coping with things in general? Would you please repeat the question, honey? What's your biggest piece of advice for just coping with things in general. What biggest advice about coping? coping. <sighs> How do you cope with the unexpected and the unanticipated, right? Life is full of surprises. There is a difference between being childish or childlike. If I ask a child, why do you do that? The child would say, because I feel like it. And that child is within us. And that child is two years old. And that language of a two-year-old is, I want, I need, I got to have, you're not going to make me, and I'm not going to. Okay? And that comes up for you when you have the gift of God, which is temptation. God gave us temptation, you know why? So you can practice the freedom of choice. But the childlike part is curious and wants to know what's going to happen next. So put on the childlike part, because that's what kept me alive in Auschwitz, my curiosity. I wanted to know what's going to happen next. I understand that single people are meeting here tonight. And many times women come to me and say, Edie, I need a man. I say, you know, honey, if I were a man, I would run from you. <laughs> if you want a man, be the fireplace that the moth wants to come close to. All right. Because most of us are hungry, hungry for affection, hungry for attention, hungry for approval. A lot of hunger that I see, and the money is not going to fill that, that hole in a soul. I like very much to really tell you tonight that the soul never dies, and it's true, it's true. I, I talk about the Holocaust because, because good people do bad things. We're not born to hate. We're not born to fear either. But you can find that little child that is within you, and you can be the healthy parent to that child. And best thing parents can do today, and I keep telling them in school, to allow the child to be a good parent to themselves, because you're not going to be there all the time. Because when you're a good parent, you give the children two things, roots and wings. 
Let them fly. The best four-letter word that I like a lot is to risk. If I would come to you right now and I would say to you, what's your name, precious? Maya. Maya, my darling, come here. Come here. Um, I would say to you, Maya, I really would like you to get to know me. Uh, not Dr. Eager, just Edie. And you said to me, you know, I am very polite to elderly women like you. And to tell you the truth, uh, I really don't like you, so why don't you just ev evaporate? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so what did I do? I risked. I just didn't want to get what I wanted. But you see, I had a girl coming from the University of Texas and telling me that she wants to die because John rejected me. There is no such word as rejection. Rejection is a word that people make up when you don't get what you want, so give up the drama. <laughs> Which, yeah. I wanted something and I didn't get it. So which God said I should get what I want, when I want it, how I want it, the way I want it. Thank you so much, so much. But you see, I think it's very important because I'm still ahead of the game because now I know where I stand with that person. But I was never rejected. The only one that can reject you is you. There you go. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Good questions. I love to have a dialogue. Just thank you for your very inspiring story. Thank um, you. We'll all take home a lot from it. Um, you want to come and meet? <laughs> Get I would a hug. love to. Um, very quickly, though, um, what did you did you ever learn what happened to your husband who was jailed? My my late husband. Yes. Uh, we were married forty-seven years. The TB came back, and he died of TB in, in San Diego. So I, uh, did he come with you? I back have three to children. I have five grandchildren, and I have three great-grandsons. That's the best revenge to Hitler, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> OK. Revenge. Revenge will give you some kind of satisfaction. But it's temporary. Okay. Doctor, you have one more here? One more. Um, when you were in Auschwitz, did you pray and did you... How did Beautiful you question. I didn't cry in Auschwitz. No, pray. Pray. When pray, you were yes. in Auschwitz, did, yes. you, did you pray and did you feel that God was slow? And how did you heal about trusting God after going through that? I did. I turned to God, I turned to God, uh, realizing that God didn't kill my parents. People did. Precious children who were told that today German and tomorrow the whole world. You see, in some ways, perhaps we are all victims of victims. That's why there is no blame here, but there is self-responsibility that I'm hoping children blame, children blame. I didn't do that, I didn't do that. It was my brother who did it. I asked parents not to ask why questions. Why did you hit your brother? Because he hit me first. And then mother says, don't lie to me. And then I tell the mother, if you don't want your child to lie, don't ask why. <laughs> <laughs> People only lie if you ask questions. How are you, fine? Fine, I used to ask my patients, how are you? Fine, fine. They weren't fine, they were suicidal. But the next time they came in, I would say, gee, it's good to see you, I missed you. So one hour, a woman comes in and a child is dying from leukemia, and we hug and we cry together, and the next hour, someone comes in with the same tears and tells me that her... Uh, her new Porsche came in, and it's not the color that she wanted. 
Now, do I tell her that she, you should have been here an hour ago and uh, should have, no, 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 I don't minimize it. I like to listen compassionately. In the English language, if you want someone to come from here to here, all you have to say is sounds like and throw in a feeling word. Sounds like you said about it. Sounds so you can feel the feeling because you can't heal what you don't feel. There is grieving, there is feeling, and there is healing. I work with cancer patients and I work with the doctors who do the curing, but the healing is an inside job. And I've been going every year here to Tyler, to the cancer clinic. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place. And uh, the chief uh, nurse is coming in tomorrow, and I'm going to have lunch with Oscar. And uh, so you see, we are really a family here. And I'm just hoping that you're going to talk to people who are not here with us. Maybe you talk to us uh, in a way uh, wherever you are and talk about the wingman and organize something because we are here in this world that we are going to be remembered I think it's a very good thing for you to go home and write your obituary column and see how you want to be remembered because this is your movie and you are the director and the producer of your movie here. How would you like your movie to end? I know when I'm going to lie on my deathbed, I'm not going to feel that my life was based on wrong assumptions. I know that my parents are now somehow somehow thinking why God she's got it. And this is the biggest gift that I can give to my husband, that he is winking and saying, by God she's got it. And the best gift I can give to my husband that he didn't leave a cripple here. Because if I can't live with my, without my husband, believe me, that's not a compliment to him. I do a lot of work with death and dying, which is about life and living. I welcome in many ways for you, hopefully, to get together with each other, to organize that you can really not just have here one night and just disappear. Get in touch with the wingman. Try the women's so you can really be the best role models to the state of Texas and the United States of America that I love. There is a wonderful young man here too. And you know, my, I had two beautiful daughters and then my son was born. And my son didn't develop the way my girls did. And five doctors told me that I have to prepare to send my child to a school for retarded children. We call it retarded. We don't do, do that anymore. It's so in intellectually challenged. So they sent me up to Johns Hopkins. There was a beautiful, again, a Christian man who took my son, four years old, after a week. He sat me down and he said, this little boy is not retarded and he's going to be what you make of him. What are you doing now, mom? And I said, I'm at the university. He said, well, I tell you, he may have encephalitis before birth, and, and if you do what I tell you to do, he's going to do everything everyone else does. It's going to take him longer to get there. See, God sent me a special child that I used that, that power that I had in me from Auschwitz. I took my son to the CP clinic, occupational therapy, speech therapy. My son is blind. He goes to Washington and he fights from the, for the disabled. And my son, John, graduated as a top 10 student from the University of Texas in El Paso. So that's what I bring you tonight. That kind of defiance, that kind of a power. Thank you.
I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I don't have time. I was victimized, but I'm not a victim. You want to, your son? We, uh, on behalf of everybody here, Thank Dr. you. Green, Thank being you. Being the day before Valentine's Day, you've really you. touched our hearts. Thank you so much. I also want to say that this is a wonderful present that was given to me. And, and there is a lady, someone's mom. Come on, son. Where are you? And, and yes. And, and, and your mom. Stand up, Ms. Yes. Huddleston. Okay. The mom is starting a new business, and there is the <laughs> name of that business, and I don't know what's, where is the name. Here it is. Cobalt. Go buy Cobalt. <laughs> this is what I got as a present. Okay. Very good. Here's a dozen roses. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Keep blooming. Keep blooming. Another round of applause, please. Well, I know, and I hope that your hearts were touched as, they, as, as mine was. So go home, be blessed. You are blessed. And remember, if the Lord leads you to, to give tonight, please give to CCA, Christian Community Action. The folks will be outside the doors. Take care. God bless. Have a great evening.